So hello everybody, last talk of the day. Is everybody having a good time at Area 41? Right. Yeah, so I'm super happy that they invited me to come speak here. This is my first time in Europe. Um, <laughs> it's been very, very fun, and also I realize I need to uh, learn a lot more German. Um, but I'm glad most of you speak English very well. <laughs> it, it's really helped me out so far. So. Um, how many times have any of you at any point in time, whether you're doing um, offensive security or defensive or working in a SOC or doing whatever, how many times have you walked into an environment and everything's on fire? You know, they have, they have no patch management, they have never had a pen test, they have no vulnerability management, they have, you know, 50 domain admins, um, they have, uh, you know, no firewall rules, everything like that. Uh, also a lot, right? Um, the reason that this talk is a thing is because um, there's been so many times that I've walked into an environment like that and I just got really super frustrated with the fact that uh, they want a pen test even though they don't even have the basics down. So with the fast pace of technology growing and growing and growing over the last 10 years, um, all of the businesses have been more worried about uh, creating whatever they're creating or providing their services. They've not really ever focused on security up until more recently, and now we're trying to play catch up. Uh, one of the, uh, the jobs that I got a lot of experience in, I did sysadmin admin stuff for a hospital in Northern Ohio, which if none of you have ever been, never been to Ohio, you're not really missing anything. <laughs> it's very flat. If you've seen corn and cows, that's, that's what's in Ohio. Um, but this this hospital was just the biggest disaster that uh, you've ever seen as far as a network goes. And, um, you know, the, through fixing all of uh, the issues there, I was able to, to learn a lot to become, um, you know, go into defensive security where I am now. So while there's a lot of different um, standards you can follow for doing security programs, so you can follow COBIT or there's NIST standards, there's, there's a lot of different stuff out there uh, that you can follow to create a program from scratch. Uh, that doesn't always uh, fit very well into a lot of organizations and you either have to, you know, modify it or uh, the person that's um, implementing that uh, security program really may not even know uh, where to even start, right? It, it's this huge standard, but it doesn't tell you in what order to do things. And, you know, if, if you're running around putting out fires because you're getting ransomware every day, it's very hard to know where to start with your, you know, if you have any free time uh, during that period. So in this presentation, I'll go over a high level of some of the principles that we try to do in our book. Um, I wrote this book with uh, Lee Brotherston uh, through O'Reilly, and it was for those people. Um, the people that either are beginning in security, you know, if, it's, if you're a student or um, are transitioning to security from an IT role. And because of all of this booming technology that we now have, a lot of that we see are companies seeing breaches on the on the news, and they're like, "Okay, Mr. Help Desk guy, you're great at technology. Ta-da! Here's security. You're now the security director, or now you have to fix all of our security because that's what we're supposed to be doing, right?" Uh, they have no idea where to start. You know, they've been doing firewall management and have no idea what's on the network, um, or they, you know, just got hired because, uh, you know. There's security jobs popping up everywhere, and they walk into that environment, and they don't really know where to start. So this is the book that I wish I would have had um, <laughs> 10, 15 years ago, um, because we were just kind of grasping at straws and hoping things would stick. Um, and then we had eventually had a really good team uh, to work through all of that. So we did everything, and, and Lee was in the same situation. He had a very uh, complimenting set of skills. I did a lot of Windows admin, firewall admin backups, that kind of stuff, while he did a lot of development and um, uh, firewall management and Linux management, that kind of stuff. So it fit really well together to kind of cover a whole bunch of different verticals that we see uh, very insecure a lot of the time. 
So let's begin with the unknowns. Um, the unknowns in any environment are going to be very scary. Um, and how will you know what level of uh, success that you have, you know, a year, five years, 10 years down the line if you really don't know where you've started? Um, at the beginning of any new security program or any deep dive into, like, if you have an existing security pro program that just sucks, um, uh, discovery phase should be one of the key points you do uh, when you start. So things like current documentation, if there is any, <laughs> um, and no matter if it's bad documentation or if it's incorrect documentation, uh, gathering all of that into one place so you know, uh, e even if, like I said, even if it's incorrect, knowing what you have that other people have seen um, and knowing, you know, what is out there, if it is correct, um, uh, so you kind of have a base starting point, things like policies and procedures, um, and no matter how simple they are, like password policy resets, you know, that the whole organization has, um, you'll now know, you know, if you're, if you're coming in as an outsider, you'll now know um, what everybody else has been taught uh, thus, thus far. Uh, two is endpoints. Um, you want a list of desktops and servers, including uh, things like uh, when they were implemented, what software is on them, uh, the software and hardware versions, the licensing for that software. There's nothing worse um, than, you know, someone leaving or uh, um, just forgetting about uh, uh, software licenses renewals that are coming up and you finding out that you've now been running a software package that has been... Um, uh, out of warranty or out of support for years because you haven't gotten in the licensing, licensing emails. Um, what's your internet f footprint? So what is, what is Shodan see, right? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll go into that a little bit later, but you should not really have much on Shodan. I've had so many customers where I've gone and, and tried to help them realize that their three slash 18s shouldn't all be showing up. <laughs> or they've, you know, uh, publicly addressed all of their desktops on the inside of their network and all of those show up. Uh, so knowing what the, the rest of the world can see um, in your ingress and egress points uh, is, is very helpful. You'll know, you know, where your threats are coming from, um, what perimeters you have to secure. Uh, networking devices, so routers, switches, APs, um, IDS, IPS, if there is one, <laughs> a lot of people don't have that, uh, and, and what's uh, happening over the network. Uh, there's a great free program I've used a couple times before called NetDisco uh, that I've implemented several times now, and it is free and open source, and all it does is pull all of your shit over SNMP, and it brings it in this great, nice graph, and will tell you what devices on what port on what switch and what software and firmware devices uh, that everything is in the network. Uh, ingress egress points I already kind of talked about and and um, the contacts for those points. So if you have a cable provider, um, you know, knowing who to contact if something happens to that uh, that cable line or if you, know, if you have to contact them for any other reason, having that in your documentation is also a good idea. And then external vendors, um, especially if they have remote access. Uh, a lot of people uh, cannot tell you who has access to what externally on their networks, which is very scary. Uh, just like any other department, um, there are virtues in having the correct staff and the correct teams in regards to security. Um, so uh, you'd want to open up cross-team communication, have teams like, <clears throat> well, you're going to have an executive team, or hopefully you have an executive team. Having somebody on that team that knows a little bit about technology is uh, always very helpful and hard for some people to, um, to uh, gain. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, so in the executive team, you'd have a CISO, CIO, whatever. Um, they're not just there to sign your paychecks or, you know, buy you fancy equipment. They can be your executive champions if you need something changed or you need 
uh, like physically changed or if you'd have um, policies in place that aren't secure, they're going to be the first ones that can really get some traction in an organization. Uh, next is the risk team. A lot of organizations already have risk teams um, for actual, like their business risk. They don't really uh, include security in that risk, uh, and they should. Whether whether you already have a risk team and they're taught about security and, and given a little bit of a security mindset to know that that should be built into whatever um, uh, risk model they have, or you can have a... Um, uh, a security role within within that risk team. Um, let's see here. Next is security team. Obviously, that's why we're all here. Auditing team. Uh, it's a good, always a good idea to have a, a system of checks and balances. Um, several times, also, I've had uh, customers that have had like net admin, security admin, or whatever, saying everything's fine. Um, but really, everything's on fire, and they're just like pretending they have uh, they have everything under control. Um, so having somebody that can call them on that uh, can be very helpful. Uh, next up, asset management. I'm not going to go over the entire little asset management wheel. Uh, this is just one way that you can go about it. And really, as a whole, asset management isn't so much of an infosec function. Um, but it should be. Um, rarely do I see people get asset management right. It's pretty impossible to secure what's on your network when you don't know what's there. Um, and in the last 10 years, I've seen maybe 2 to 3% of customers actually doing asset management correctly. Uh, for a long time, I did... Um, like SIM management, I did a lot in Splunk, and any of our customers that would have to like give us their information when we were setting up Splunk, um, out of that three years, I had one customer when I asked what their domain controllers and DHCP servers and you know all the other you know, application servers, all that, one person, when I asked for that stuff, they had it ready, <laughs> um, which... It was very impressive, kind of knocked, <laughs> knocked me back. I was just in awe, I almost cried. Um, but how can we get some of this information if you're starting from scratch? Things like ARP cache and switches, uh, DHCP, NMAP uh, uh, commands, PowerShell, SNMP, WMI, if you have a vulnerability management uh, software that can scan, all of that can kind of come together to give you a, uh, a main list and that is the list that you're going to want to go off of. Something that can be scripted and automated and is your golden golden list. Hopefully it's not in SharePoint because, swear to God, if I see another asset management list in SharePoint, uh, I'm, I'm going to scream. So a lot of lifestyle, uh, not lifestyle, geez, life cycle um, uh, stages between uh, delivery and decommissioning that you have to worry about. So uh, knowing where your assets are coming from. So if you have um, uh, like shipping and receiving that are getting assets in, sending them to different um, uh, departments, and they're just plugging in into a network jack, hopefully eventually you'll have it to the point where you don't know some, uh, you don't, you will be alerted if something that you don't know is plugged into the network or connects to the Wi-Fi. A lot of times that doesn't happen as well. Knowing that it, it's possible to come in from shipping and receiving means that they should be on your asset management team and able to see that list as well. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so going to Shodan again, um, that is on the uh, this bottom right-hand side. Um, it's created by John Matherly. It's one of my favorite tools to go and just see the random shit that's on the internet. Uh, but that's what you should be doing to your um, uh, your IP space as well. Uh, up here on the upper left-hand side is a tool called OSINT Framework. Uh, it's actually a website, OSINTFramework.com. And it will uh, give you a whole bunch of different ways you can put perform OSINT, which you should be doing against your own employees, your own devices, your own, you know, whatever. Anything that has to, anything that you would do to attack uh, a client, you should be doing for your own network. Um, I've also started to do this before I take jobs. 
because <laughs> you then kind of know maybe what you're getting into if you can see, you know, uh, there's 30 devices on, on that company's network that have just RDP open to the internet. You might not want to take that job if you really don't want uh, to go gray earlier. Um, Buildwith.com is very helpful if you don't really have um, uh, the control in your web presence, you can see what vulnerabilities you have out there based on uh, what it's built with. It'll tell you like it's running Apache version, whatever. Um, and that gives you a little bit of idea of those assets as well. Recon NG uh, is a uh, tool written by um, Tim Tomes and it's kind of used like um, uh, Metasploit. So all from the command line, and it will do things like look for what email addresses are out there on Google or LinkedIn or whatever. Um, and those end up being the highest targets when it comes to uh, phishing attempts, right? So, you know, you have marketing, you have VPs, you have um, uh, people in finance. Those are always really, really top targets when it comes to uh, phishes you will know who those top targets are based on whose email address uh, is out there on the internet because that stuff is super easy to script and that's where the script kiddies are going after and that's if there's an active attack that will be in their list as well. Um, you need to assess your threats, threats and risks. So if you don't know what your risks are, it's very hard to uh, defend against them. <clears throat> Um, things like, uh, so hopefully there isn't anybody that does uh, like GRC risk compliance stuff uh, in the audience because I'm not going to really cover this very much in depth. Um, but it's often split up into uh, four different steps. Uh, identify, assess, mitigate, and monitor. So identifying, um, organizations should be concerned with identifying uh, the large risks posed to them either if it's their um, uh, if it's a banking specific risk or if it's things like ransomware, which everybody is usually concerned about, um, you'll want to uh, take into account internal and external vulnerability scans, firewall rule audits, um, and all of that will kind of lend a, um, a larger picture to the type of overall risk that you're uh, exposed to. Um, uh, second is assess. So you can, um, uh, after those risks have been identified, you want to assess them to determine if they actually apply to the particular environment. There's nothing worse than having um, alerts come in for, uh, you know, you're, you're being attacked with this Apache struts vulnerability thing from the internet when you don't have Apache running. Uh, three is mitigate. So mitigation of risks is kind of the meat and bones of why we're all here. And the purpose of the majority of this talk and the book is mitigating all and defending against these risks. Options include avoiding, remediating, which we want to do both of those first off, <laughs> and then transferring or finally accepting, which that makes all of us shudder is when people just accept the risk. Uh, and then four is monitor. Uh, you want to keep track over time with like a, schedule, a scheduled quarterly or yearly review meeting. Uh, throughout the year, a lot of changes are going to happen to the network and it's going to affect the uh, type of data that you have. It's going to affect uh, what you're in, you know, all, all of those things that we already talked about finding. It's going to possibly affect all of that, and you want to take, uh, take that into account um, with these reviews when it comes to your risk. Uh, I like to recommend this as a first technical step. Um, so starting a security program from the ground up can be extremely daunting. Uh, with so many different facets to consider, consider <clears throat> uh, the more initial thought and planning that's put into the creation of that program, uh, the easier it will be to do in the long run. You're not going to want to um, uh, do, do things for the sake of routine or because with, with the uh, mindset of we've always done it this way, that's where um, a lot of security uh, vulnerabilities and, and uh, mismanagement come into play is, is when there's um, uh, thoughts like that. So uh, things like uh, patch management, um, taking just taking devices off the network that don't need to be there. Uh, it's very, very low hanging fruit, things that are, that are going to be caught mostly by script kiddies, turning off ports that are exposed to the internet. All that stuff is low hanging fruit that you want to take a look at first.
Um, so a lot of what we cover now uh, will be free, right? Uh, a lot of it's covered in security frameworks like OWASP, PCI, uh, and I and I highly recommend using, recommend using all of those as checklists. Um, and yeah, uh, a lot of that can be up to interpretation as well. Um, things like PC, like PCI and and HIPAA and, and all of the other compliance frameworks that are out there sometimes get a lot of flack. Um, but it's very hard to have an overall list that works for everybody. Um, and a lot of what they recommend, um, I mean, the, like the, the CIS um, security controls, a lot of what they recommend can be implemented for free. Uh, not necessarily when you have to consider in your time, um, but the technologies themselves, you don't have to have a giant security budget to do. So first up is uh, segmentation and networking. Things like uh, access control lists. Oh my god, what a concept. Um, how many times have I seen people not filtering tra their traffic outbound? And trying to convince people to tra filter their traffic in general seems to be a, a, a huge struggle sometimes. And they're like, oh well, all, all threats come from the outside, so why should I have to filter anything outbound? People are just accessing websites, right? Um, it's very hard to kind of get in the mindset that the threats can be on the inside as well. Uh, Geo-blocking. Uh, I mean, most of our U.S. customers block China, Russia, uh, Netherlands. <laughs> so sorry if any of you need to access any of my customers' websites. You might not be able to. Um, but that's where a lot of the threats come from. You know, if... if uh, Right now, I do a lot of stuff in uh, a, a different sim for my company, and even though we have uh, only U.S. customers that are doing business only with other U.S. customers, 90% of the hits on their firewall are coming from China. <laughs> uh, turning on geo-blocking will pretty much automatically stop all of that and just drop it dead, and you don't have to worry about uh, that as a risk anymore unless they're you know, VPNs, all that kind of stuff, but all the automatic stuff anyways. Uh, segmenting with VLANs, one of the largest uh, complaints and the most often I see on pen test reports and vulnerability scans, whatever you want to call them, um, is the fact that there's a flat network. Anytime that there's uh, malware that spreads throughout a network, it's because they have one VLAN and everything is on it, and it's uh, it's just traversed their network like that because they have nothing else in place. They have not only do they not have VLANs, there's no uh, access control between the VLANs, or there's like one firewall that is still allowing everything outbound, and sometimes everything inbound, which is also scary. Uh, Role-based uh, servers, so things like. Not having a domain controller also be a SQL server that is the back end to your external facing website, <laughs> uh, which has happened um, because you know you you don't want any external you don't want any um, uh, additional stress on your you know primary roles if you if you're in a um, Active Directory domain you don't want that Active Directory server to do anything more than what it's supposed to be doing um, for resources purposes and for security purposes. Ah, Windows, the OS that everybody loves to hate. <laughs> uh, I kind of have to admit that I was uh, uh, a huge Windows, like a uh, group policy geek for a while. <laughs> Um, it's not something that anybody really enjoys doing because it's a gigantic pain, especially when it's implemented incorrectly first off. Uh, I actually went into an environment that had about 20 different group policies uh, applied randomly with random settings, no really rhyme or reason behind it. And um, it, again, I don't want to admit it, but it was really fun going through all of that and just picking and choosing and redesigning all of that. And And I mean... There's so many different security settings and group policy, and you can lock down a system to really do only what it's supposed to do, which is a novel concept, um, without having to have an endpoint protection. I mean, yeah, endpoint protections are still nice, and it's going to be really important, but um, you know, uh, reducing the risk that it has to uh, uh, combat is uh, also you know, defense in depth. 
Um, things like disabling um, LLM and R in NetBIOS. If you're in offense, you know, like uh, if you're on a Windows network, 99% of the time, you're going to be able to capture credentials uh, over over the network with Responder. And it's super easy. It takes like three commands and boom, you already have credentials. Uh, and disabling it is not that difficult. The only only problems that I've had with disabling that is some um, uh, older systems that don't seem to know how to use DNS. <laughs> So if there are you know, like AS for hundreds, mainframe type stuff, sometimes there are printers, that kind of thing that has, have no idea that DNS is a concept. And that can really mess up things sometimes, but with, like with all of this, you're going to want to test all of that. Uh, WSES, very important to have updated patches. Uh, getting rid of open shares. Uh, at, at the hospital that I have worked at, we actually had open shares with Excel documents with passwords in them. Um, there's an Nmap scan, and there's also a PowerShell command that you can run to just search your entire network for open shares that are out there. Uh, multi-factor auth and authentication. Uh, we all know multi-factor auth is great. Something else to think about is how often you see it implemented on systems internally and how it really, really messes up red teamers when you do have it implemented internally and correctly. Um, it, you can also implement multi-factor auth incorrectly. Uh, there was a program that I will remain nameless that instead of getting um, a push notification to your phone, it would just call you and you could hit pound and that was your second factor auth. Technically it is, that is another factor, but what we had was um, External offices, not with cell phones, they just had 50 people use the uh, receptionist's phone. So anytime that they logged in, uh, they would know the phone number it was coming from. She wouldn't even listen anymore. She would just pick it up, hit pound, and hang it up. It's nothing easier than bypassing that for multi-factor auth. It's technically implemented, and you will get a nice compliance check mark, um, but it's not secure in any, any way shape or form. Um, LAPS, so it is uh, the local admin password solution for Windows. Um, I actually implemented this for the first time uh, the beginning of last year. And it, it was one of those things like um, uh, with the company that I was working for, they always had it on uh, all of their reports. You know, implement LAPS, have, you know, different so what it does is it changes all the local admin passwords to be different, so you can't pivot very easily. But uh, nobody on our team had ever implemented it before. And it's just one of those things where you know it's a good idea, you've never done it before, but you tell everybody else to do it. Uh, nobody that I know has ever done it, um, because it's kind of a pain in the ass for your help desk people or whoever's adminning your boxes. It's way easier just to memorize what the local admin password is and go up and, and you're done, right? Well, uh, what I didn't know when I implemented it, and thank God it wasn't at a customer the first time I did it, is it actually changes your domain admin, admin password as well. So thank God for VM snapshots, because otherwise I would have had to rebuild my lab all over again. Uh, least privileges ever, anywhere, segmentation of rights. So like don domain admins, should there should only be one, maybe two uh, people in domain admin, uh, schema admin, power user groups and uh, the use of those should be audited. It shouldn't be, here's your, your uh, sysadmin group, they log into their everyday machines with domain admin, that's not something that should be done. They should be logging in with their own least privilege accounts and only doing the things that they need to do with that. Not running services with it, not installing software with it. Um, that's, that can actually lead to way more problems uh, later on down the line when you have to take some of that domain admin rights away. Um, so a little bit about system hardening. We already mentioned um, uh, endpoint detection, whatever, right? There's a million of them out there. Uh, creating a golden image is very important when you're trying to harden your endpoints. I recommend a lot of times if it's a Windows box that you should, uh, NIST has some uh, already pre-hardened policy out there that you can download and install. 
I recommend putting that on the golden image. That way, if a computer can't access the domain or is removed for some reason, there's already a standard of security in place um, that you don't have to worry about if it can't contact the domain. Application whitelisting. Uh, has anybody, I, I've, I've talked to one person so far that has gone into an existing environment that didn't have uh, uh, application whitelisting and actually successfully implemented it. It was a larger company, um, and they had the backing and the resources to do it. I see a lot of times people not wanting to put in the effort just because I mean, it takes a lot of work, especially if you're doing it retroactively. But having a golden image also makes it much easier to do application whitelisting because you know you know what's going on uh, onto the network in, in the beginning. Uh, things like using encryption and BitLocker, packaging your Linux boxes, removing unneeded software. How many people actually need Java? I mean, some of us probably do. Um, but for our end users, how many people actually need to have Java or Adobe Acrobat or all the other, you know, 10,000 uh, super unpatched softwares that are out there? There's, and there's, there's um, third party management. Uh, patch management systems that you can use for the people that do need that. Uh, things like upgrading the firmware is also on there. For the love of God, implement TLS 1.2. <laughs> uh, SS, you know, from uh, SSL version 2, version 3, TLS 1.1.1 and 1.2 are all very insecure, and this is why we see all of this. Um, at one point, I saw that it was something like 48% of um, uh, SSL sites on the internet were vulnerable to one of these. That's a lot, uh, especially considering some of the more important ones that uh, you know disclose a lot of information. Uh, there's sites like SSL Labs that you can do as tests against anything that you have. Um, to see if it's vulnerable to any of these, as well as like vulnerability scanners will tell you. You can use URL scan, which uh, it actually screens incoming requests uh, to the server by filtering uh, based on rules. So it's kind of like a WAF for um, uh, IIS. There's fail to ban that scans logs uh, looking for potentially malicious traffic. Both of those are free. Uh, mod security is like a WAF for Linux boxes and Apache. You should be doing um, uh, like full HTTP traffic logging uh, eventually, right? That's something that you can get to eventually. It's that's not free for the most part. Uh, I mean, there are L, um, uh, log management solutions out there that are free. Most of them aren't great. <laughs> so uh, one of the first things that I'll um, recommend is when you actually do have a budget after you've completed all your free stuff and done your due diligence. Uh, that you actually get a, a really good SIM and log management uh, utility. So extra stuff. Uh, one of my favorite things in the book was the fact that we got to write an extra stuff chapter that didn't really fit in anywhere else. They didn't let me use a picture of a unicorn, um, but it was stuff like blocking DNS zone transfers um, from anything that's not your own DNS server because uh, attackers can use that to uh, gain inside information into the network and what domains you use. Close open mail relays. This isn't so much of an issue now that people have started to move to um, uh, Google Mail and Office 365 and everything in the cloud because I don't think it's really possible to have an open mail relay at that point. Uh, it was usually all of the uh, exchange admins that were out there just popping their exchange boxes on the internet and not configuring them with anything. Um, and they were just open to send email out to the rest of the world, no matter who you were. And it gets you on blacklist super quick. Uh, you can disable Telnet and other secure protocols. And if you can't, you should alert on their use. Again, that's a, that's a good thing for like an IDS SIM solution. Um, because just like just like saying you need to patch you need to patch your shit and and really getting on the case of system admins when they don't um, if you've ever been in an enterprise security environment sometimes it's impossible to do that you have multi-million dollar contracts on a box that's Windows 2000 that's been sitting there for years and years and years and you will lose that support and you can't 
you don't have the budget to have a new piece of software replace that one. Um, it happens a lot in medical industry. Um, you know, that Windows 2000 box is hooked up to a $3 million CT scanner. Uh, and you can't replace that CT scanner right now, and you can't um, replace the box, and you can't update it because then it will break. You don't want to brick a CT machine. Uh, DNS servers should also not be openly recursive. Some other extra stuff shown here is that tool that I mentioned earlier, that net, uh, NetDisco. It shows you the name of the port, um, what VLANs they're on, what's actually connected. You can run reports, and it's a great free tool. Uh, don't forget your printers. Anybody ever remember when uh, all of the Nazi stuff got printed out from uh, what's his face to a bunch of the printers on the internet? Um, you don't don't want to forget your printers. A lot of red teamers that I talk to um, actually will get domain admin creds off of printers quite often. Uh, you want to locate and detect. Uh, sorry, locate and destroy plain text passwords. Turn off turn off your open Wi-Fi. Uh, when I, again, when I worked at that hospital that was the, the gigantic disaster, um, I got a call from the help desk saying, hey, there's a lady that can't connect to the wireless, we can't figure it out, can you help her? Talked to this lady, she was actually down the street, she had been using our Wi-Fi for years and now couldn't connect anymore. Um, so you'll find out real quick people that shouldn't be using your Wi-Fi if you actually uh, secure it how you should be. And Instead of, you know, NIST came out with the new, you shouldn't have to change your password now very uh, very often if it's uh, of a certain length. And they're changing all of their standards when it comes to what you should be doing for uh, uh, your password security, right? Instead of worrying about that, I've done my best to start preaching password safes um, and the use of those either Across the organization, there's a lot of good tools out there that you can do role-based password uh, management and not have you know people having them on sticky notes and all the other problems that we all, always see with passwords and um, uh, password reuse right outside of an organization as well. Oh, I have to hurry up. I have a lot more slides left. Um, so now we've gone all over quite a lot of information that can mostly be implemented within the first year of the security program. Once those threats and risks have been identified and assessed, uh, you also should prioritize them. You don't want to always take um, a tools uh, like a vulnerability management or an outside vendor's um, recommendation when it comes to uh, prioritizing these because what might be a priority one in any other system may not be because of compensating controls where you're at. So it's 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 a good idea to um, put a lot of thought behind your prioritization and that can di differ greatly from organization to organization. Um, create some milestones, things like uh, separate them up into tiers. So tier one will be quick wins that you can just do now. Like I said before, you know, turning on some firewall rules, taking some stuff off the network. Tier two, like this year, what you can, what can you accomplish in the next 365 days um, that isn't going to make huge disruptions? That isn't going to be a complete redes redesign of your entire network. Um, it's not going to cost you know a lot of capital money. What can you do in that year? Um, yeah, is 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 the next step that you want to take. Next year would be tier three. So in the next two years, what can you accomplish? Uh, good examples are like implementing two-factor auth, upgrading um, major systems, uh, you know, major device replacements. So like any any head-end uh, equipment, whether it's um, uh, like main firewalls or or your Wi-Fi access or whatever. And then tier four is long-term. A lot of times this stuff will take years and years to accomplish, especially like I said, with that CT machine, that might just be a year five goal. You're gonna have to put compensating and controls in place um, to deal with the fact that you can't do anything with that Windows 2000 box. And like do new data center builds, you're not gonna be able to sp spin up a new like DR site like that either. Oh, another thing, um, uh, it's really good to tie those milestones to critical controls or if you're under any compliance um, standards. 
because then you can say, hey, I have to do this because otherwise I won't be PCI compliant. Um, and then you want to work with your stakeholders. Present your research, um, let them know, uh, you know, what what the risks are in the other uh, departments. You know, if it's, if it's HR and they want to know, all right, well, I used to have access to all this stuff and now I don't work with them and let them know why, you know, you don't want to just be another face behind, uh, no face behind a, a, a computer screen. And then you can also explain uh, the cost avoidance of, you know, what would happen if they did get breached and you lost all of that customer data, what that would actually look like. Uh, this is one of my favorite things to recommend too, is an IR bug out bag. So has anybody ever like, or is, is anybody, or has anybody ever met a prepper? Or like there's a TV show about prepping, it's like you're, you're waiting for the next zombie apocalypse, you have a gun and extra socks and clothes and, uh, you know, water for so many days and all that kind of stuff. This is what you should have if you're doing your own IR. Um, because, I mean... So you, you want bootable USB drives or images or whatever. Uh, your golden image offline, so you don't want your golden image to be hacked and um, exploited and then you're like, after, after you do all of your IR, you're now rolling out your golden image that also was, uh, you know, has malware on it or whatever. Um, laptops not on domain if you're on a Windows domain because if your Active Directory gets hacked or accessed, really, it's Microsoft's recommendation to start over, start over from scratch, which is any Microsoft admin's night, uh, like worst nightmare. Shitloads of storage for like memory dumps and disk forensics. Um, I should have my book up here too, but it, I think I wrote this before I wrote the book. <laughs> um, there's actually, the Blue Team Handbook was um, what I thought my book was. So I, I, I bought this thinking that, okay, this is uh, the book that all blue teamers need to fix all their shit. Turns out it's just instant response, which it does a really, really good job of. It already has like lists of stuff you should do in IR situations and templates and all that kind of stuff. Um, Sans has some really good templates. You always want to have snacks. Um, and MiFi, that kind of stuff, if, uh, if you don't have uh, the best network connection because of something happening. Uh, purple team. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of purple teaming inside a network. Um, one of my new favorite things to do is use um, the MITRE ATT&CK framework and just go through all of it internally. Um, if you ever use a Kanban tool, it's very nice to um, put all of the MITRE ATT&CK framework in internally and see what you can detect on your own network and see what you can break on your own network. Um, you know, within within reason, you don't want to be, you know, shutting down a bank or or anything like that. But this right here is um, an example of us internal purple teaming in our uh, in our network. And this is I don't think it shows. No, this is event ID uh, forty six twenty five, which is failed login attempts. Does anybody know what is going to generate something that looks like this? Anybody red team? So this is an SMB brute force on Metasploit, um, and it has different uh, thresholds, right? There's different speed settings. It's five to one. Um, five being, I think it's five being the most aggressive. Yeah. So this is five, three, and one. Uh, this is just brute force SMB password reset, uh, password attempts. This is something that is extremely easily detected if you're uh, doing your log management correctly and you have that log coming in. Um, the first one being the default that I've always seen red teamers use. Um, they're wanting to do as fast as possible because nobody ever detects this. Um, the second one, it's going to take them a little bit longer and the slowest speed setting they're never going to really do because otherwise it's going to take them months to finish their uh, attack if it's somebody malicious or their, uh, their report if they're doing it uh, on purpose. Uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, things. A couple things I already talked about. Um, uh, using Responder. If you haven't turned off LLMNR, 
uh, you can see how easily that works on the inside of the network. Um, Metasploit and Map, MassScan, any any of the free tools that are out there. There's a million different things you can do internally to Red Team that it doesn't really um, uh, impact uh, you know day-to-day -day operations. Not just compliance, but secure compliance. Um, again, like that uh, two-factor auth program that was implemented, it was comp it was compliant. Right, they they were definitely P, uh, yeah PCI compliant in that case, um, but it wasn't secure. So having having some secure thought behind the compliance. Compliance isn't bad. It's really good to use as a standard sometimes if you know what you're doing, and um, can put some like intelligent design behind it. Uh, and then show me the money. Do we have a budget yet? After you've done all of that due diligence you should hopefully get a budget if you don't have one already. Um, and you know everything that we had gone over, yes, it's gonna take a lot of time, but it's also free. Um, things like buying a real vulnerability scanner, um, getting an expensive SIM, a lot of the IDS, IPS that are out there that are free are good anyways. Two-factor auth, advanced cyber buzzword blinky boxes, um, password safe, stuff like that. Any, anything that's gonna cost you a, a large license. Endpoint protection is always you know, a high license that's up there. I could probably talk for a long, long time about logging. Um, I'm just gonna show you a little bit here though. This is what I talked about earlier. The first one's Netherlands. This is just one of our customers over, I think it was over 24 hours where all of the external traffic was coming from. They only do business in Michigan. It's like a sandwich shop. Um, they're not selling sandwiches to the Netherlands, I guarantee it. Uh, so turning on geoblocking for the top, oh, they could do all of those. <laughs> so let's see here, it's uh, Switzerland's number three. Some of you are wanting sandwiches really bad, I guess. Uh, China, Russia, all that kind of stuff. Um, this is another thing that I've, uh, I got from a friend of mine that runs, um, if you've ever seen the Windows logging or Linux logging cheat sheets, uh, this is Hacker Hurricane's thing. Um, this is uh, advanced file auditing. You can turn that on on Windows and um, audit when files are accessed. So when you do that, you can actually see uh, you know, this is normal file access, normal file access, and I give you one guess as to where the malware started accessing all the, or the ransomware started accessing and encrypting all the files. Something also that's super easy to threshold and alert on. And finally, uh, user education. <clears throat> this is from that same hospital after we had already fixed oh, so much stuff. <laughs> Um, you know, user education gets a, uh, a bad rep sometimes because, you know, they're only users, they're not, uh, you know, they, they don't care, you know, but uh, I've actually seen correctly implemented user education that makes those users your first line of defense. It's, you know, having, whether it's 100 to 100,000 different sets of eyes um, on something weird going on in the network, if they have, an easy avenue of reporting whatever's weird or fishy in this case because we did that one completely on fish puns uh, because I love puns, even though they do cause international incidents for me sometimes. Um, it's, it's very important to have those users kind of on your side because it's not just our job um, uh, for security, it's, it's everybody's job. Um, and if they can say, yeah, I, I had to type in my email address and password twice to the site and I normally only have to do it once. Um, something like that is gonna really, really aid in, this, in the, um, uh, how speedily you go through your IR uh, in an incident like that. <clears throat> so in summary, we've just covered a whole lot of stuff uh, very generally and again, um, this wasn't meant to be dropping O-Day talk or some incredible threat research because that's not really what's needed uh, in, in the majority of cases, right? A lot of, a lot of what we see is the same shit that we've seen in the last 10 years. 
And that's exactly what this talk is for. That's exactly what the book is for. It is for, you know, trying to, <laughs> trying to make it a little bit more difficult for all of us uh, to break in. Or doing blue team stuff. I would love to do cooler shit as opposed to just the same recommendations over and over and over and over again. Um, if, if we can improve that security standard across the board, um, that's, you know, that was our big and lofty goal. Um, and we're doing good so far. <laughs> uh, I think having the porcupine would be, is, is great, uh, for, you know, in general, it was, a, a lot of people asked me if I got to choose the animal. Um, and no, I didn't, uh, I, I could have, but we spent way too much time going back and forth trying to figure out, uh, what it should have been. And they're like, here, have a porcupine. So that's why there's porcupine on the cover. Um, and this is me. Um, that's my Twitter handle, co-author, co-host on Breaking Down Security. Breaking is spelled correctly because the other co-host's last name is Break, B-R-A-K-E. Uh, I've, I've heard of people that don't want to listen to the podcast because they thought we spelled breaking wrong. I blog and I love unicorns and I have three awesome kids. And I don't know if I have time for questions. We've got a couple minutes. Okay, all right. So if there's any questions, if not, uh, you can catch me later on. Don't, just don't speak German to me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thank you very much, Amanda. Like, that was yeah, a great hero <laughs> slot of the day like to finish on. Um, if anyone has some questions, that'd be great. We still got a couple minutes before the barbecue starts, so let's get in on that. Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, <laughs> we should have had your book 10 years ago. Um, <laughs> right? <laughs> the, uh, when I had to do something similar 10 years ago, I, I didn't start out with any of that. I started out with security policy, and I, in retrospect, it may not have been the best idea, but where does policy fit into all of the practical rec recommendations, like... Do the practical stuff first. Do the policy some balance. Uh, I think I think balance definitely. Um, if you have bad policies, I think starting by fixing those is, is should be at the at one of the first and foremost things that you do. A lot of times, people don't have time for policies. Like I said, they're running around putting out all of these fires, whether it's ransomware or you know not knowing they had an attack, but their intellectual property just ends up somewhere on the other side of the world. Um, Policies aren't fun. <laughs> Procedures aren't fun. I mean, there's very, very few percentage of people that enjoy writing those. I'm not one of them. Um, there are a lot of uh, free templates also out there online um, that you can just kind of download their policy and like, oh, look, this is the password policy that we're supposed to be using, or this is the login policy that we're supposed to be using, and you just rebrand it with your name. Um, that will save a lot, of, a lot of time and effort for people that already have a lot of more important things to do. Cool. Any more questions? No? Everyone pretty hungry for dinner, I guess, huh? Cool. Thank you, Amanda, so much again once more um, as well. Yeah, please.